Welcome to part one of what will hopefully be two or three parts on the notes on gravitation. We began these notes in class and as part of that we did cover a majority of what needed to be presented. However, we were cut short and it's a three-day weekend and well, let's get cracking. So we did discuss the idea that weight, the force due to gravity that we typically think of as acting on an object by the Earth is actually a neutral force between the two objects. That this force of gravity we say acts on the object because that's the thing that we see moving. We fall off of a ladder, we jump off of a high dive into a swimming pool, we drop a tennis ball. The object goes into motion and accelerates towards the Earth at 9.8 meters per second squared. And it seems pretty consistent. This is always 9.8 meters per second squared, unless there's air resistance, but in most of the problems, the things we're dealing with, we can neglect air resistance. So that M, the object near Earth, we, we got that. The G had to be something connected to the Earth. Something about the Earth was causing that 9.8. And it was always constant because, well, we're always pretty close to the Earth, as we can see here with octocorn sitting on the surface of the Earth, again, not drawn to scale. The range of motion of octocorn compared to the size of the Earth, just like your range of motion relative to the Earth, is very, very minuscule compared to how big the Earth actually is. And your mass, somebody else's mass, a car's mass, a gigantic boulder's mass, we're all on the same order of magnitude compared to the mass of the Earth. So it doesn't matter where we are and how big we are, we tend to always have the same acceleration. So we think of it as a constant. But we seem to intuitively know from some of the maybe science fiction movies and cartoons we've seen that if an object goes far away from the Earth into deep space, that the acceleration of gravity, well, a lot of people think it just disappears, but it definitely gets smaller. It's kind of intuitive that there's less gravitational attraction the further out you go. Now, the Earth's mass stayed the same. The only thing that happened is we moved further away. So there's this tendency excuse me, to think that that gravitational attraction is maybe an inverse relationship with respect to the uh, distance, that as the distance gets bigger, gravitational acceleration gets smaller. And it's similar, but not quite the same. Uh, the acceleration due to gravity is actually an inverse square dependency on position. And that position is from the center of mass of the Earth to the center of mass of the object. Again, octocorn, you, me, our radius from uh, the center of us to our largest extremity, it, it's not that big compared to uh, the Earth. So uh, if we go across large distances, we just say to us, and as long as a, that arrow is contacting us, we're okay. Now, what's really important here, and we didn't discuss it during class because we're talking about magnitudes, is that this is actually a vector quantity Acceleration is a vector, and if we have the acceleration of octocorn, you, me, anybody else, going towards the planet, but the radius is measured away from the planet, those are opposite directions. We can actually say that the acceleration due to gravity as a vector is going to be negative g times the mass of the planet over the magnitude of the radius squared, and then we can put an r vector hat. Now we're used to using x's and y's for the Cartesian coordinate system, but whichever way you want to measure that r value, the acceleration of gravity is always going to go right back along it towards the center. So in reality, this is a vector in the radial direction um, that is going opposite of whatever direction r is pointing. Now a second point, now this popped up in one class but not in the other, was well, okay Mr. Zuck, we get it, this you know, you get closer, the acceleration due to gravity increases, uh, you get further away, it decreases, but what happens if you were to go inside the planet? So let's take a look at that real quick and explore that idea. Uh, here I've got a modest picture of the Earth. And if we were to somehow bore a hole, maybe add a little bit of an eraser here, let's say we drill a hole into the Earth, it doesn't seem to be letting me erase it very well. <laughs> Anyways, we'll, we'll just say that we've drilled a hole towards the center of the Earth there. We've turned Earth into a slightly like a Pac-Man. 
there's water still sloshing around because that's what water does. If you were to go inside the Earth, say to a position like that, would your acceleration of gravity you experience decrease, increase, or stay the same? It's an interesting question. You have, you would think it should decrease, and if we look at this as a sort of graph, where we have distance from the center of the Earth on the x-axis, and the acceleration of gravity on the y-axis, and I apologize, that's really driving me crazy. Can I get rid of that cursor? There we go. Um, we've got this inverse square relationship, but that's only up until we hit the radius of the Earth, or whatever planet you happen to be talking about. And at the surface, that should be a value of 9.8 meters per second squared. Actually, let me move that up a little bit higher. So at the radius of the Earth, we should experience an acceleration of 9.8 meters per second squared magnitude. As we move further away, that should decrease, and we have an asymptotic value approaching zero as the distance away approaches infinity. Kind of classic inverse square relationship, hyperbolic sort of look. The question is, what happens if we go less than the radius of the Earth? And what we discussed in one period was that the acceleration of gravity is not going to keep going up. In fact, it's going to decrease. Because if you think of the center of the Earth as being at that point, you are closer to it. So it would make sense with an inverse square relationship that you would go up. The acceleration of gravity would keep increasing. But the problem is that you do not have all of the mass of the Earth in front of you. Some of it's behind you. Your radius value is the smaller value than the radius of the Earth. However, if you were to statistically look at what mass is not underneath you, there's a whole bunch of it. There's a big chunk of the Earth that is now on the other side of you that is going to try to pull you away from the center of the Earth. You're getting pulled towards all mass. And we just say on average, you're trying to get pulled towards the center of the Earth, but at the point you move inside the Earth's outer radius, you're going to have mass pulling you back. So not all the mass is in front of you, some of it's behind you. It's gonna be in a tug of war, so you're actually gonna lose acceleration. And if you get to the center of the planet, you have all mass in all directions pulling on you, you're in equilibrium. There's no gravitational net force acting on you, you'll have no acceleration. So if we're going to have no acceleration at radius zero from the center of the Earth, and we should decrease if we go inside the radius of the Earth, we're going to get something that just looks sort of linear. Now, there's a lot of math that goes into backing that up, and we're not going to do it uh, because uh, I think I've done it one time before, and it was miserable. But it makes sense that if you have mass on the other side of you, that's going to prevent you from wanting to go towards the center of the Earth. And once you get there, you should have zero acceleration because you're balanced out everywhere. So that's generally what it looks like. Now, we're going to go ahead and pause uh, this video series here. Uh, we'll go into part two and talk about the gravitational potential energy and how it changes when we're dealing with astronomical scales. See you then.